Welcome to Philosophical Conversations, I'm Sarah Jane Leslie. In the early 1980s, feminist thinkers Catherine McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin sought to undermine the availability of pornography through several proposed local ordinances. For the purposes of these ordinances, pornography was defined as material that depicts women dehumanized as sexual objects, things, or commodities, enjoying pain or humiliation or rape being tied up, cut up, mutilated, bruised, or physically hurt, in postures of sexual submission or servility or display, reduced to body parts, penetrated by objects or animals, or presented in scenarios of degradation, injury, torture, shown as filthy or inferior, bleeding, bruised, or hurt in a context which makes these conditions sexual. Of course, there is much material that would not normally be classified as pornography which is not targeted by these ordinances. Material that is, say, sexually explicit but without the brutal character here described, or indeed material which does not feature women at all. Notably, these ordinances did not target pornography by appeal to obscenity laws as many prior efforts had done. Rather, they proposed that pornography that is, material that conforms to their particular definition, constitutes a violation of women's civil rights. One of the ordinances begins, we define pornography as the graphic, sexually explicit subordination of women in pictures or words. Now a careful listener will notice that pornography here is not characterized as depicting the subordination of women, but rather as being the subordination of women. That is, pornography is not simply said to show women being subordinated, nor even to cause women to be subordinated. Rather, pornography is itself said to be or constitute that very subordination. One might well wonder what sense we are to make of this, and perhaps the answer is none. After all, a district court judge called this characterization a certain sleight of hand, and it has since been deemed philosophically indefensible by several academic commentators. By the mid-1980s, the ordinances had all either failed to pass or had been struck down on the grounds that they violated the right to freedom of speech. Pornography constitutes speech, it was decided, and so is protected under our First Amendment. Law professor Catherine McKinnon, however, has argued against this ruling on ingenious grounds. Pornography, she argues, silences women. It prevents women from fully exercising their First Amendment rights, and so the issue at stake is one of balancing the rights of one group against another. However, the claim that pornography silences women, like the claim that pornography is subordination, has been dismissed as confused or at best highly metaphorical. The status of these claims goes right to the heart of the legal issues at stake. If pornography is subordination, then the First Amendment right to free speech must be weighed against the Fourteenth Amendment right to equality. And if pornography silences, then one group's First Amendment rights must be weighed against another's. As McKinnon frames it, the free speech of men silences the free speech of women. It is the same social goal, just for other people. But are these claims plausible? Are they even intelligible? We will hear today from Professor Ray Langton, who has famously argued that these claims are both intelligible and plausible. Professor Langton's work draws upon 20th century philosopher J.L. Austin's famous work on speech acts. To illustrate Austin's theory, consider a simple utterance made around a dinner table. Can you pass the salt? On one level, we might describe the event of a certain interrogative sentence issuing from the speaker's mouth. The speaker made certain noises recognizable to other English speakers. Can you pass the salt? 
This level of description constitutes what Austin called the locutionary act. Of course, any time we open our mouths, we may bring about myriad consequences. By making this utterance, I may cause my companion to provide me with the salt shaker. And by making this utterance, I may impress my companion with my finely tuned palate, or I may offend the chef who considers the dish already seasoned to perfection. Such consequences may be numerous and need not bear a particularly intimate relationship to the utterances themselves. They are, in Austin's terminology, merely perlocutionary acts. Austin, however, identifies a third and intermediate type of act, the illocutionary act. Even though the sentence I uttered, can you pass the salt, was interrogative in form, ending with a question mark, as we might say, it did not constitute my asking a question. I was not inquiring as to whether my companion was in fact able to provide me with the salt. Rather, my speech constituted a directive, a request for the salt to be passed to me. If we do not recognize the notion of an illocutionary act, Austin argued, we have identified only the impoverished locutionary act, according to which I uttered an interrogative sentence, and the myriad but distant perlocution reacts, such as my offending the chef. What, though, is the relevance of this speech act theory to issues concerning pornography? Joining us today to discuss this question is Professor Ray Langton. Dr. Langton is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge and Professorial Fellow of Newnham College. Professor Langton has authored two books, Sexual Solipsism and Kantian Humility, along with over 50 articles. She has held appointments, either visiting or permanent, at MIT, Yale, Oxford, Edinburgh, and many other such prestigious institutions. Professor Langton, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Now, can you pass the salt is a very ordinary, everyday utterance. What about more ceremonial utterances that we might make? For example, when we say, I do, when standing at the altar. Well, exactly. So that's, um, that's just the sort of example that inspired Austin in the first place. So he was really interested in how we use words to perform certain actions, like I do in a marriage ceremony is the act of marrying provided certain conditions are in place. So provided certain, what he called them, felicity conditions are in place. So um, you s say, I do, and your spouse-to-be says, I do, and there's a qualified celebrant there, um, and you do it all by the book, or you did it all right, then in saying, I do, you are marrying. You know, Austin's interest in the performative side of speech, which was uh, what grabbed him in the first place, um, was, yes, marriages, um, christening ships. So you raise the champagne bottle and you smash the champagne bottle against the ship saying, I hereby christen this ship, the Queen Elizabeth. And since you are the authorised person and that was what you were supposed to be doing and you did the whole thing right, that was a christening. It's not that it caused a christening to happen downstream. It's not just that everybody then believed that that was the name of the ship. Um, and it wasn't that you were describing your own action, I'm here by christening the ship. It's the action is enacted in saying those words. So the really important issue here is that when you say I do at the altar that doesn't have the consequence of you being married that actually is you or, or the consequence of you marrying that actually is you marrying when you christen the ship it doesn't just cause the ship to be christened that is the christening it is that it constitutes the, the christening and it constitutes the marriage that's one thing that Austin wanted to emphasize. And so Austin's distinction between illocutionary acts and perlocutionary acts uh, is one of the things that enables you to distinguish what gets constituted by what you're doing with your words and what gets caused 
Those would be the perlocutionary yes, acts. Yes, which would be the perlocutionary acts, exactly. So the idea behind this ordinance, or the idea that's in play in a philosophical defense of it, would be the idea that pornography doesn't just, at this first locutionary level, the level at which we talk about the particular utterances, the particular sentences that we make, doesn't just depict women in that first order sense, nor does it depict women as subordinated, uh, nor does it cause, in the perlocutionary sense, women to come to be subordinated, but rather, just as an utterance of I do can constitute marrying, in the same way in the pornography case, um, the actual pornography itself can constitute subordination. Is that the idea? That's, that's the idea that we're exploring, exactly. That's the idea. Um, and it might look a bit puzzling um, because it's not as if we have some familiar ceremony of subordinating um, in the way that we have familiar ceremonies of um, christening ships mm -hmm. or promising or marrying or to take all of those other ceremonial examples that um, inspired Austen. But in fact, there could be a ceremonial uh, illocutionary act of subordination and if we think about how there could be we might see how that could extend to the case of pornography. So what might be an illustration of a more clear-cut ceremonial case of subordinating? Well imagine that someone is uttering this sentence black people are not permitted to vote one way they could be uttering that sentence would be in performing a speech act of describing a situation in which citizens who are black are not allowed to vote. For instance, a reporter might use those words in describing the situation in South Africa during the time of apartheid. Now imagine someone using those words, black people are not permitted to vote, but they're not a reporter, they're a legislator. And what they're doing in saying those words is enacting law. In other words, they're enacting apartheid law. What are they doing when they do that? Something completely different to what the reporter would be doing if the reporter was saying black people are not permitted to vote. Um, so here you have an illustration of the way in which the very same words can be used to perform completely different speech acts. In the one case, uh, an act of asserting or describing. In the other case, an enactment of law. Um, and if we think hard about what that enactment is, um, we'll see it might extend, though, in ways that, are, that might be controversial. Huh. So how would that go? How would it extend? Well, if you agree, and you might not, if you agree that a legislator who utters the words Blacks, black people are not permitted to vote in a context where they're enacting law, so they are doing a number of illocutionary things with their words, that legislator is. They, um, they are depriving black people of certain powers and rights, notably the right to vote. They're ranking them as inferior. They are legitimating discrimination against them. So if you agree about that, and I think it's very plausible for a case of apartheid legislation that it is a speech act that enacts subordination, um, then we have a handle on how there can be speech acts that enact subordination and what it would take for pornography to be a speech act that's subordinated. And by the way, not just pornography, but other sorts of speech as well, perhaps mm -hmm. hate speech or other kinds of oppressive speech. Mm -hmm. But thinking just about pornography, um, might it ever uh, rank, might it be speech that ranks a group as inferior? Might it be speech that legitimates discriminatory behavior against members of a certain group? Might it be speech that deprives a certain group of powers or rights? Those ideas are worth pursuing, I think. 
Just as saying I do under the right circumstances constitutes marrying, certain speech acts can constitute subordination, such as when a legislator enacts a profoundly discriminatory law. But there would seem to be an important difference between a legislator and a pornographer here. A legislator is endowed with authority while a pornographer is not. When we are wondering to ourselves, could pornography be an illocutionary act of subordination against women? Um, well, think about that case, the case of the legislator. Well, the number one question in response to that has got to be, how on earth could you compare the speech of a pornographer to the speech of a legislator? What do you think? The pornography is somehow playing God and is enacting uh, laws under which uh, women have to live in the way that the legislator is enacting rules under which um, um, black and white people in South Africa had to live. And of course it's not exactly analogous. The point of the analogy is not to say these are exact analogies, it's to say that when speech is authoritative in a certain way, um, it can rank a group as inferior and legitimate discrimination against them and deprive them of certain powers. And even if pornography doesn't look particularly authoritative, it might have that sort of authority. Though it is a matter of considerable dispute, some scholars contend that the sort of brutal pornography under discussion here has profound societal effects. Encouraging violence towards women, promoting rape myths, and so on. If pornography has the power to produce such far-reaching effects, then we might suppose that it must have authority in our society after all, albeit in an unofficial manner. The way I would put it is, the fact that it shapes people's attitudes, if it is a fact, is evidence that it's authoritative for them. Suppose someone were to say, Fox News has no authority, and then suppose we find that viewers of Fox News in fact change their beliefs and attitudes in response to watching Fox News. That to me is a sign that it has authority for them. So in other words, what we would be doing in that situation would be looking at the evidence on attitudes, not just for its own sake, but because it's evidence that the speech in question has a certain sort of authority. That's the thought. So evidence can come in when we're thinking about the perlocutionary effects of speech and it can, be, and it can come in when we're wondering whether um, pornography might satisfy um, the felicity conditions that need to be satisfied for speech to be subordinating speech. So what you're providing is a model according to which we could actually make philosophical sense of the claim that pornography is subordination. And I think it's important to notice how your claims are very conditional in nature. So it's conditional upon um, pornography having this sort of authority. Evidence for that would depend on this conditional concerning whether there's empirical support um, for pornography having all these ill effects on people's attitudes, but fundamentally what's at the heart of what you're saying is here's a philosophical model according to which we can make sense of pornography literally constituting subordination. That's right. There's a sense in which if certain conditions were fulfilled, then pornography would not merely cause subordination but enact subordination. Mm -hmm by constituting norms that legitimate it, by ranking a group as inferior, and by depriving them of certain powers. Now another aspect of the argument put forward by Catherine McKinnon concerned pornography's uh, putative ability to silence women. So how are we to make sense of, of that claim? On the surface, it maybe looks like a, a silly claim. Why would pornography in any way have an impact on, say, women's ability to produce vocal utterances, uh, so on and so forth? So how should we think about the status of that claim? Well, just as thinking about speech in terms of speech acts, doing things with words, doing illocutionary things with words, in the very same way, you can think of silence as not just mm, 
not making any noise, but silence as inability to do things with words, even when you say the words. So Austin's own book, How to Do Things with Words, is full of wonderful examples. So when he's talking about the marriage case, you say, I do. You intend to marry your spouse to be, or your would-be spouse intends to marry, and then you find out that the priest is a monkey in disguise. I think that's really in How to Do Things with Words. Um, or he's another. Not what one wants to discover on one's <laughs> wedding day. <laughs> yes. Where does he. Anyway, what an imagination. Anyway, and the christening example. Uh, there you are, about to smash the champagne bottle onto the prow of the ship, and some low type dashes up and grabs the champagne bottle, low type being Austin's phrase. Um, grabs the champagne bottle, smashes it against the ship and says, I hereby christen this ship the Generalissimo Stalin. <laughs> so I mean, Austin's full of uh, hilarious examples like these. And Austin says, we can all agree that that would be an infernal shame. <laughs> and we can all agree that the low type did not succeed in christening the ship. Why not? because the low type lacked the relevant authority. So if you don't have the right sort of authority, more generally, if you don't fulfill the felicity conditions, if the utterance isn't made in a context where the conditions for its being felicitous are there, um, then your speech will misfire. So Austin's idea of speech misfiring is the idea of saying your words but not performing the illocutionary speech act you were trying to perform with those words. So, um, the low type, he doesn't christen the ship. Uh, he says those words, he says the right but words. his words don't constitute christening the exactly. ship. Exactly. Um, another example that I like, though it wasn't used for this purpose, uh, is in the work of the philosopher Donald Davidson. He imagines an actor on a stage whose role in the play is to say, fire, fire, I mean it, look at the smoke. You mustn't be too convincing with this example. Anyway, and then a real fire breaks out. And he really wants to warn the audience. And he says, fire, fire, I mean it, look at the smoke. And in the second case, he says the words trying to do something completely different to what he had been trying before. Um, it doesn't work. Why not? Something about his situation stops his words having the illocutionary force that he wanted them to have. Now, one thing that we've already mentioned is the concern that um, feminists have had about pornography that it may weaken attitudes about sexual violence, it may legitimate um, discriminatory behavior understood as um, sexual violence. Now how does that happen? Ronald Dworkin, the other Dworkin, uh, said that um, pornography is being compared to someone who said, when women say no, they don't always mean no. In other words, pornography is being compared to someone who destroys uh, a woman's power to utter the word no and give it the force of a refusal. Uh, actually, Ronald Dworkin himself didn't completely get to the bottom of that. But anyway, he at least acknowledged the point of that comparison. If pornography propagates certain rape myths, as the sociologists call them, for instance, when a woman says no, she doesn't mean it, in a real-life sexual 
conversation. A woman who says no, intending it to be a refusal, might find herself in the position of that actor who is trying to warn of a fire, but he can't get the warning to come across as a warning. His utterance is trying to be uh, an illocutionary act of warning, but his hearers don't recognize it. Now we're bringing in a different condition, the condition of uptake, as Austin called it. it the hearers need to recognize that the speaker is um, warning, and they don't in the case of the actor on the stage saying, fire, fire. And a woman trying to say no, or, sorry, a woman saying no and trying to uh, perform the speech act of sexual refusal can be like that actor. Um, saying the right words with the right intention, but something about her situation, maybe something about her authority or her lack of it, maybe something about the hearer's inability to recognize it, or um, it doesn't succeed as a refusal. And by doesn't succeed as a refusal, I mean it misfires as a refusal. It's not just that it doesn't get listened to properly, it doesn't get recognized as a refusal, so it isn't a refusal. So this would be a circumstance under which a woman says no to sexual advances. And a case in which not, as you might find in some cases of rape, the uh, rapist continuing nonetheless, fully aware that she's refusing, um, but rather this would be a case where the woman says no, but perhaps the rapist has the belief that uh, women always say no, but they really, in fact, mean yes. So that's right. It's, we're thinking about a case which is not the case where um, the refusal is recognized as a refusal and the rapist just continues anyway. We're thinking of a situation that is much more sort of ambiguous than that and which might be more common in situations that are sometimes described as date rape. In fact, there's, there's quite a close analogy between what is being claimed about pornography and a famous case in British law. Um, so there was uh, a man, Morgan, his name was, Mr. Morgan, um, who had been at the pub with his friends. And he told his friends uh, that his wife really liked rough sex and uh, why didn't they come home with him and have sex with his wife. Basically, he invited his friends to come home and rape his wife. Um, they argued that they genuinely believed that she was consenting because of Morgan's testimony about what she liked. Um, even though she was screaming and saying no and saying in every possible way that she didn't want it, his false testimony about her, they argued, in a certain sense was legitimating their behavior. There you have an individual spreading a very malicious rape myth about his own wife. What McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin are describing is a sort of more general case of that. Mm -hmm. Certain sorts of pornography spreading rape myths about women more generally. Where refusals might be heard almost like some kind of playing along, um, some sort of dance, as it were, rather than actually That's right. constituting refusals. Yeah. So this would be a way in which pornography might, um, philosophically speaking, genuinely be said to silence women. Pornography brings about this state of affairs whereby women are unable to engage in certain illocutionary acts, namely illocutionary acts of refusal. So that's the thought. The thought is that um, once we're alert to the different sorts of things we are doing with words when we speak, once we're alert to um, the different dimensions of speech that Austin identified, then silence is not simply a matter of saying no words. Mm -hmm. 
it can be a matter of being able to say the words but not get those words to be the elocutionary act that you mean them to be. And um, this particular sort of elocutionary act, sexual refusal, is a hugely important speech power. I mean, it's so important that if you haven't got it, um, you will get raped. Mm -hmm. So it's not just any old power to speak we're talking about. We're talking about a particular, particularly important kind of speech, but it is a power to speak. So, And if you have that power undermined, then yes, it's a, it's a way in which you are silenced. That's the thought. So what, if any, legal consequences would you draw from this? Does this make the case for censorship, or do you think it falls ultimately short of the standards that would need to be met for that? Well, one question is whether you're asking this, you know, is anti-pornography legislation compatible with the First, Am with the First Amendment? You know, I'm not enough of a First Amendment to know the answer to that, but I would have thought that the commitments to equality that are there in the 14th Amendment um, m might be relevant. Um, I think more generally, an important question is, what is speech for? And why do we want to protect speech? And if the reasons that we want to protect speech are because it helps us get better knowledge of the world or because it helps us communicate with each other or because it helps us understand what's going on in the government so that we can make informed contributions to democratic life. Whatever we think the goals are of principles of spe free speech, we should ask ourselves whether those goals are in fact being served by permitting the sort of speech that is the graphic sexually explicit subordination of women in pictures or words. Um, are the goals of knowledge being served, the goals of communication, the goals of political participation? I doubt it, but I'm not going to go further on that one just here. Social and legal controversy surrounding pornography encompasses issues that are of great political significance, free speech and equality, censorship and subordination. Whatever one's ultimate take on the issues here may be, the twin claims that pornography is subordination and that it silences women are not to be dismissed as mere philosophical confusion or sleight of hand. Professor Langton, thank you so much for joining us here on Philosophical Conversations. It's been great to have you. It was really a terrific interview. It was so great to talk okay. to you. Okay, well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>